Good morning, everyone. I, I'm, I have the absolute delight uh, of introducing Megan to you all. So, Megan, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Hello, my name is Megan Bright Goodwin, and I am a math faculty member at Anoka Ramsey Community College that is just outside Minneapolis in Minnesota. I am working within the Minnesota State Colleges and University System, and I coordinate a faculty a classroom research program called Minnesota State Reflect. And I also am working on a statewide project where we are redesigning what developmental mathematics education looks like within our system. Welcome. I guess I'll jump right in with a question. So to get some vocabulary on the table, I define quantitative literacy as being comfortable with numbers, not necessarily being able to add or subtract or multiply and divide them very quickly, but being able to look at something and not run away crying or not run away into a corner and say, I can't do that, that, you know, five scares me. So to what extent do you think quantitative literacy and maybe general problem solving skills, uh, some mm -hmm. things that you might learn from a mathematics course, not specifically algebra or calculus or trigonometry related, but general principles. To what extent do you think they've contributed to your personal or professional success? So interesting. I think that uh, quantitative reasoning in itself is um, a very specific type of reasoning. And I think that having it in combination with other types of reasoning, like I think about proportional reasoning, algebraic thinking, um, that type of thing. The quantitative reasoning is a really uh, central element to that because often uh, we can see and speak and uh, interpret patterns numerically. And I think that uh, there's kind of like this broader reasoning that is super important. And that's uh, really reasoning that can dive into uh, relationships between things that change, um, maybe change together uh, and understand kind of the dynamics of that. Um, and as applied to my uh, professional world or professional life, when I work with faculty in the classroom research program, we are often looking at um, impacts or experiences that students like have and impact impacts on their learning and uh, potentially like outcomes, like student outcomes on things from everything from uh, professional uh, licensure exams to, uh, you know, uh, just even course retention and uh, success and then assessment of learning outcomes and stuff. And we often look at like what happens if we change this element of what it is we do in our class or we change the way that we teach the content. Maybe it's a sequencing change or maybe we're going to contextualize it. What happens when we do those things and make changes here and what are those impacts on uh, what actually happens in the student experience and um, in what they are able to take forward. And so uh, really uh, taking things that often like sound like, oh, like how can we even quantify these things? Sometimes we don't even quantify them. We <laughs> at least go strictly qualitative, working with qualitative uh, evidence and data. Um, but we, we always are looking at relationships between, you know, the variables that we are controlling and these outcome variables that we are measuring. And I think it's really neat um, to have a background, uh, especially the quantitative background, to be able to work with people who have that expertise in what it is they teach. And again, that that is everything from like HVAC to uh, like you know, large enrollment biology courses at universities um, to think about what they know about their content field, what they know about their teaching, what they know about what outcomes their students need for their programs or their future courses and stuff. Um, and then to be able to help them wrap a study around that in things that are measurable to explore those relationships is is really key. Very cool. Next question, I guess, in line is, uh, how would your professional life differ would you be doing the same thing? Do you, do you see yourself doing something else if you didn't have the same relationship with uh, the simple mathematical ideas one might pick up early on? Ooh, so um, I, am, I have a very specific faculty content area. I teach mathematics and statistics. So the, you know, 
I, I probably wouldn't be in that field. Um, but I do, I do want to say with a little sidetrack that um, I actually did not like math. I used to use the words, I hate math until I took uh, physics in high school. And then I suddenly was like, oh, um, there's actually like, like we can take, we can take these, you know, relationships, these functions, and they actually describe real things like from funny things like, you know, the like my my physics teacher in high school had this bear that hung from the ceiling on a magnet. And then there was this thing and it was like, you could like, could you get the, I don't know, it was like a arrow or something to hit the bear. And uh, like these problems and these dynamical systems that, um, you know, that, that we're looking at how things change together. I thought that was really cool. Um, and then uh, at that time I realized like, oh, like the stuff I'm learning in calculus actually would describe what's happening a little better. My first round of physics was an algebra-based physics. Um, and that was concurrent with my first calculus experience where I was learning things on like uh, instantaneous rate of change <laughs> and stuff like that. And so uh, what that did was, it wasn't so much that I love the calculus, but I wanted to see that calculus in a calc-based physics course. So I uh, enrolled in a calc-based physics course after that. And uh, anyway, I don't know, long story short, but there was, I had no interest in math until that. And then the reason why I really shifted towards being a, you know, being a mathematician, majoring in mathematics, uh, going into the field of education was my work study job. As a college student, I was tutoring math. And, um, and then I, I quickly realized that I liked uh, thinking about how other people were doing the math and thinking about, you know, like starting with like what they were seeing and understanding and how they were interpreting it. Um, whether that's like, if they, if they had a really strong sense of like accessing the mathematics through a graph or if they needed to see numbers or if they needed to talk it out and attach wild, wild like things to it about like, Oh, so this would be like, you know, if the price goes up, if we, see the I, I, the supply go down or whatever like there's you know like to to hear how people were coming and accessing the math and then using that to try to uh build toward these big ideas in you know there was a lot of algebra pre-calc and calc that i was uh tutoring and um and to see that magic where things come together and really building on their thinking that that's what got me to where I'm at. So um, early ideas, I think your original question was on like early ideas of quantitative reasoning. I'm really grateful that I had a relatively strong background um, in my quantitative reasoning because I was able to to kind of enter those those pathways with, with confidence or like not those pathways, but like those experiences with confidence. My own, I, I kind of had a an interesting, my parents were both teachers and my dad was a math teacher. And so like when I was growing up, if we were having dinner together, my dad would ask for something silly, like three sevenths of a glass of milk, which I mean, what is that? And then <laughs> if you poured it in and then if he said, oh, actually that, that kind of looks a little bit more like, you know, nine twentieths of a glass of milk, we'd have to know if we were supposed to take a, or like we didn't have to, but we'd have to either <laughs> take a sip out or pour more in. And, sure, um, sure. and that was just kind of the, the, that, that was very common, like what would happen in our house. Um, I remember going on road trips where we had a, uh, like, I remember driving through, uh, I grew up in the Midwest and I remember driving through Iowa and we were on this road trip and like as a family, we were we were trying to name all the different ways we could use nickels, dimes, and quarters to make one dollar. And just you know, my parents were just killing time with us, right? But but those were my early experiences, um, and that that really set up a foundation for kind of my relationship with quantitative reasoning. And I'm really grateful for that. I guess that leads us into the, this next question perfectly. Uh, can you think of any specific examples or maybe situations where being comfortable with mathematical thinking or, or having a good relationship with quantitative reasoning helped you tackle and, and if all is good in the world, maybe even resolve a complex problem that you're dealing with? 
Okay, so I'm in Minnesota and we do winter sports. And in high school, I participated in a Nordic skiing, cross country skiing, um, also known as the uphill ski team because we ski up the hill and down the hill. Um, so the, the sport was relatively new to the to Minnesota, um, Minnesota State High School League for that. And at the time at my school, this was a a, a girls sport um, is what they, how they def- like we were a sanctioned girls sport through the Minnesota State. And we were really underfunded. Nordic skiing is a relatively cheaper sport than say football or hockey, but we were not being equitably funded. And so we were running into some issues where uh, essentially what we needed was a bus that would take us out to a county park to practice because our team was predominantly uh, middle school and then early high school. So people who weren't able to drive. And so there was no way for us to get to an appropriate training space. And so I, I was a junior in high school at the time that this became really a crunch point um, due to the composition of our team. And I was really upset. It was a big problem. And I was able to access some public records of funding um, within our school district and looking at like the cost to run different athletic programs. And then um, also uh, looking at like how they were, how they were funded, (laughs) if you will. And I realized that there was a significant inequity in like the percent funding of the Nordic ski team. And um, it just so happened that I had a little nugget in my pocket because my high school that year had gone to um, the had gone to state in football. The football team uh, somehow the athletic department was able to buy them all new shoes and some other equipment that magically appeared within that budget. And so I wrote a pretty strongly worded letter um, addressed to the school board with the evidence of what I was observing within the funding. And in it, I said, "Here's what." Title IX law says, here's what the school district says, here's what the budget says. And um, before I took it to the school board, I uh, got some FaceTime with our athletic director and I I just gave him the letter with my supporting data that showed the disproportionate funding (laughs) of what we were needed. And um, he said, well, what is it you want me to do? And I said, well, I want you to make this right. Otherwise, this letter is going to go out tomorrow. And I just sat there and I looked at him because I I knew, like I knew quantitatively that there was an, I had evidence of a big problem. (laughs) And he, he mumbled and it felt like an eternity, but it was probably 30 seconds. And he finally just said, all right, you got your bus starting tomorrow. And uh, I was like, problem solved. That Not necessarily the story. biggest problems in the world, but like to be able to go in at like where I, where, you know, I was just a junior like student and to be able to go to a position of authority with a well laid out argument with the quantitative evidence that said, you've got a problem here. I've identified it. This is my ask. It was, it was very powerful. It reminds me of a, a phrase my significant other frequently uses, or I guess the rest of my family does as well, that uh, often I'd rather be right than happy, which I guess in their head means that I'm, I'm having an argument and I'd rather be in the right position than be in the happy position and just shut up or, or, or you know take what's being offered. Uh, but in the example that you shared, it certainly sounds like you were both right and happy which I guess is the the happy medium that everyone wishes to attend. Thank you so very much. I'm sure that the students will enjoy this as much as uh, as I did. Thank you again for being so generous with your time, and I appreciate your answers. Awesome. Bye, everyone.